Hello everybody, this is Johns Hopkins with Baltimore Heritage and we're back with another of our 5 Minute Histories videos. And today I'm in East Baltimore off of Boston Street near Browning Highway and behind me is a set of houses that was built in 1943 as part of the war effort during World War II. Um, the housing complex was called O'Donnell Heights. Eventually the neighborhood took that name also, so I'm in the O'Donnell Heights neighborhood and we're going to talk about that uh, today. Um, uh, if you heard me say Browning Highway and you say, well, that doesn't look anything like the Browning Highway I know. The Browning Highway I know is down by the Marine Terminal with all sorts of heavy industry. Well, we're on Browning Highway up where it's residential. And in fact, this housing complex got built precisely because it was near that heavy industry, which at that time was uh, part of the war effort. So we're going to start our story by turning the clock back to the 1940s in Baltimore. In the 1940s, uh, uh, people were flocking to the city to try to get jobs in the war industries and we had dozens of war industries here maybe a hundred maybe more um, some of the bigger ones included of course Bethlehem Steel and Martin Aircraft but there were loads and loads of them and the problem was that we didn't have enough housing um, for all these new workers and their families moving in that was of course a problem for the workers and their families the federal government also viewed it as a problem that was hampering the war effort if you didn't have enough housing Houses, you, you couldn't get people where you workers uh, where you wanted them and so in the uh, World War II era the federal government built housing for workers here in Baltimore they built I believe five different complexes um, including O'Donnell Heights the one behind me um, and those complexes were uh, segregated based on race this was a, a housing complex for white workers if you were a black war worker you hopefully found housing in places like Turner Station or Cherry Hill um, we're going to get to housing in a second, but let's talk about two of the industries that were targeted, two specific companies that were targeted uh, for this housing, uh, the Maryland Dry Dock Company and then Bethlehem Fairfield Shipyards. Let's start with the Dry Dock Company. It got its start in the 1920s um, as the Globe Shipping and Dry Dock Company of, of Maryland. Um, and in World War II, it did not so much build new ships as retrofit existing ships for, the, uh, for war purposes. So it took ships that were built for uh, one thing and turned them into another. We think of uh, the ships in World War II, of course, as the iconic battleships and all of that. But we needed lots of other ships to transport things like clothing and food and tanks and soldiers. And that's what happened at Maryland Dry Dock. Um, they converted uh, all sorts of ships into, uh, uh, say, food transports or ammunition transports. And they apparently needed a lot of workers for it, which is why this housing is here. All right, the second industry was the Bethlehem Fairfield shipyard and certainly workers there were building and finding housing in the neighborhoods of Curtis Bay um, and Brooklyn uh, but that was such an enormous engine they could not get enough housing and so this housing uh, was built for them as well uh, presumably the workers would get bussed over there each uh, each day um, and Bethlehem Fairfield didn't retrofit ships it built new ships it was created uh, in World War II uh, by the federal government and these were called emergency shipyards giant engines of building new ships. Um, ours here, Bethlehem Fairfield, on uh, September 27, 1941, we launched our first Liberty ship. That's right, uh, Bethlehem Fairfield, uh, among other things, made a lot of Liberty ships. In fact, 384 were launched from here in all in addition to 45 LST ships and 94 Victory ships. That is a lot of ships to be built, uh, especially considering it operated only over a four year period. So after the war was over, the federal government found itself owning these housing complexes and kind of not knowing what to do with them. Some of them were torn down. Uh, they were built for the defense uh, of uh, in World War II, and that was over. But some of them, like this one, weren't. Uh, the, these houses were built with cinder blocks and apparently are pretty sturdy. And it was converted into public housing. And in its early years, it really thrived. Uh, people flocked to it. In fact, the neighborhood grew up around it. It had so many new families families and kids, there were all sorts of infrastructure issues with water and sewer, and schools especially. There was a bus strike. Parents refused to send their kids on the bus uh, because the overcrowding in the schools and the bad transportation to and from schools. Um, in those years, this was still an all-white housing complex. If you were an African-American family, you could not live here. Um, integration happened uh, not until 1967, so 20 years uh, or so after the war ended. 
Um, that's when the first black families started to move in. Uh, when the news uh, arose that they would have black neighbors, a number of white residents picketed. And when the first black families moved in, uh, the National Guard had to be called out to make sure things uh, went smoothly. And in fact, the first families that, uh, that came here, first black families, the Baltimore Public Housing Authority uh, bought them uh, uh, telephones. This is 1967, so bought them wall-mounted phones um, and uh, paid for a few months of their phone service, essentially so that they had a helpline in case things went really bad. Um, there were definitely tensions, but fortunately there was no, uh, there was no violence. All right, we're going to wrap up. Fast forward to the 1980s and 90s, um, and these uh, 1940s buildings were definitely the worst for wear. Not a lot of maintenance, uh, and they were in pretty bad shape. And the neighborhood here also had its fair share of problems. The Baltimore Sun is full of reports on crime and drugs and neighbors trying to uh, tackle those issues. Um, but beginning in about 1910, or, I'm sorry, 2010, excuse me, about 2010, um, the city starts to address these issues. And in 2017, an enormous chunk of these World War II era houses were demolished, um, clearing way for a new housing project uh, that also has a new name. Uh, it is no longer O'Donnell Heights. Uh, it takes its name from the fabulous views from its front porch, so to speak, of the Francis Scott Key Memorial Bridge. And the new houses um, are called Keys Point. So I'm going to leave you uh, with this thought uh, for those of us who are eager for some good Good news coming out of Baltimore. We certainly have our fair share of bad news coming out of Baltimore. But keep your eyes out uh, here in Keys Point uh, as these 1943 World War II houses continue to uh, rebuild themselves and rebuild the community around them. Thanks so much and we'll see you next time.